Not everyone, not everyone gets a round of applause and you're ahead of the game. That's right. Don't lose it. <laughs> Roger says it's a relaxing evening. I'm not so sure it's relaxing for me, but I'll try and I'll try and make it a little stimulating. I hope that what I have to say to you sets off some questions, so that after you've been able to recharge glasses and so on, we can have a bit of discussion. Um, I, apparently, I'm supposed to introduce myself, so I should start by doing that. I think so. I'm a, I'm a public health doctor. I'm also an epidemiologist, and you don't want to say that too many times while you're talking. Um, I work as, as a life course epidemiologist and I look at statistical methodology that's related to life course epidemiology and that's enough of those big words. Um, but mostly my role is now to lead the new Growing Up in New Zealand study, as Roger has said, and I'm also director of a cross-faculty centre at the University of Auckland, which is looking at multidisciplinary population studies that are designed really to provide evidence to inform policy. So that's essentially tells you what the Growing Up in New Zealand study is about, although I'm going to give you a bit more detail in that. So I thought I'd start with a question, so throwing it out so that you have to do some work as well. Raise your hands if you're not eating, that is, or drinking. Don't raise your glass. Raise your hands if you think that New Zealand is a good place to bring up children. Right, so that's a mixed result, but I'd say about 75% of you think that that's the case. But that pretty much could be a two-e billboard at the moment if we believe the international statistics. So it's a year right moment, because actually... The international statistics tell us that New Zealand actually ranks really poorly on child health and well-being statistics. And if you look at our record in the last decade, then we come 29th out of 30 countries overall for our child health records. Now, if that was a World Cup, we wouldn't even get to the pool games, let alone qualify and win the World Cup. So we're not doing very well with our children. Basically, those statistics also hide a huge range of differences, obviously, for our children within our population. So we've got vast inequalities for our child population. We know that our Māori and Pacific children in particular have much worse health than our European and our Asian children. And really, I guess it's those sort of things that have been vexing many people, including many of the people in the room, many researchers, many politicians, to say, why on earth is this the case? We all think New Zealand is a wonderful place. It should be a good place to raise children. We've just won the World Cup. It's a great place to breed all blacks. Not such a great place to grow up for all of our children, or so the statistics tell us. So basically, driven by a desire to try and understand why we constantly see these statistics that are very worrying, we wanted to gather some evidence about what it is like to grow up in New Zealand today. Because basically there's a lot of interest in that now. We've got the Children's Commissioner who's just come out and told us that children are our most valuable resource. We also have Minister Bennett with her green paper where she talks about vulnerable children and wanting to do something to look after them. So a lot of rhetoric around the idea that children are important that early life is critically important for, for setting out trajectories of development that are going to lead to good, healthy children who will do well in the education system, who do well in terms of health, who will grow up to be productive New Zealanders and actually who will have healthy children as well because the whole thing goes across generations. But probably despite all of our angst, really, at the statistics, at the inequalities that we see beneath the statistics, and actually despite billions of dollars that we've spent over the last decade or so to try and make a change to our child health and wellbeing statistics, we're still seeing that they're there. We describe them brilliantly. The problem is we don't understand why we see them. And until we can understand why, and until we can understand why we see the differences, we're not in a really good position to actually do anything about them. And I think that is the underlying reason why we set up this new study, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. I guess it's hard to understand. I mean, research has been going on, particularly in child health, particularly in terms of education, for many, many decades, obviously, probably centuries if you think about it. So the question is, why don't we understand? What is it about what we know that is limiting in terms of informing policy, particularly, that's likely to help our children to do well? Well, probably it's because we tend to rely a lot on association. We rely a lot on evidence, on something that links one event that's happened at one point in time with an event that happens downstream. And we take that evidence to turn that into policy. So we take, for example, 
the well-known finding now that watching TV for several hours as a child is associated strongly with that child's likelihood of growing up to have antisocial behaviour and many other issues, criminality <coughs> and so on. A well-known result from our Dunedin longitudinal study from 38 years ago now. So the natural response to that is, is not to say that's wrong, because actually it's not wrong. The association is very strong. But to leap from that and to say we can fix the antisocial behaviour by stopping children from watching TV when they're children, I think, is naive. And that's really the premise of the new argument, that I think we are beyond simple solutions to what are complex and entrenched issues for our children and for our families. And that basically what we need is a more joined up approach that crosses over multiple areas of child development and understands that most of the issues that we see in statistics actually are the result of multiple things happening over time and interacting together to create the person that you see at any particular point you choose to measure them. And actually that's, I guess, the philosophy behind the new study. So let me tell you about it for a bit. Growing up in New Zealand is a new longitudinal study of children and families. It has recruited some 7,000 plus children and families. The children were born in 2009 and 2010. They were born in the greater Auckland through Waikato regions and South Auckland in the middle, right down to National Park and right over to Coromandel and, and unfortunately not Waitakere because we didn't have enough money to do that one. But three DHB areas and, and all the women who were pregnant during a particular year were invited to be part of the Growing Up study. Some differences about how we set this study up from some of the other studies. We set it up by recruiting in pregnancy. We recognised that if we were going to do a new longitudinal study to understand what it was like for children to grow up in 21st century New Zealand and what created the outcomes that we're seeing in these statistics, we needed to actually start before they were born. Because we know that the pregnancy period itself is a really important part of setting up trajectories for development post-birth. So we set, out, we set out to recruit mums who were pregnant. There is no register of pregnant mums. It was quite a challenge. Some women don't even know they're going to be pregnant in the year that you're recruiting, of course, until they realise that they are, which can be quite a shock. 40% of the mums were like that in the study. Two of mine were like that, so I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. Two out of three, so that's a bad proportion. But basically... Um, we set out to recruit mums who were pregnant. We wanted to recruit them during their pregnancy at a time where all the women were eligible, so not too early, so the third trimester of their pregnancy. We also wanted to invite the dads in, and we did. So we invited mums and dads in pregnancy, and we saw them for the first time then. We also then wanted to follow up what happened in their first two years of life in detail. Many other studies have started at birth, They've then followed children up when they're about three or four. We've had four data collection waves. In fact, we're in the middle of the fourth data collection wave before the children are two. So our children are just turning two at the moment. Half of them have turned two already. The other half will turn two up until June next year. So a lot of information that we've gathered from families in the first two years of these children's lives. And we've gathered that information across multiple disciplines. So we've worked not just about health, but we've worked about family background, about where the parents have come from, about what they identify with, about what their family means to them, who their families are, where their families are, where their support is, what their education is, what their aspirations are for their children's education, what their intentions are in terms of working now and returning to work later, or not working for that matter as well as many, many other things. We spend 90 minutes with mums and 60 minutes with dads every time we see them. Dads complain about how long it takes and mums are quite happy, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so this information has been explicitly designed not just by a research team at the University of Auckland that is working across all the faculties and all the disciplines, but actually with 16 government agencies along the way as well. So we work differently from some of the other research where we find the research findings and we think, wow, this is exciting, we're going to go off and talk to the Minister of Health or the Minister of Education. We've actually worked with them along the way and engaged them at the whole stage of the process. And we hope that that will allow a more timely engagement and timely translation of the evidence that we're finding about these families into evidence that can actually inform strategies, that can cross over agencies and really address the reality for those families. Because I think again, like the associations argument, 
we're trying to get towards a causal pathways argument and understanding about how and why things evolve and how they evolve across multiple domains at once. And basically then give that back to those people who are charged really, who we elect I suppose and we'll be electing them again soon, to basically go away and create policy that is designed and relevant for our population. So we think that the Growing Up in New Zealand study is really valuable. It's not cheap, and I'm sure you might want to ask me about that later, investing in something like this and building a strong foundation to launch something that is designed to last 21 years needs a strong foundation. For many years it feels like you're filling money into a hole, and it is like building the foundations of a strong multi-storied building. We're just seeing those emerge from the ground, and there's a lot of discussion about that, as you can imagine. A lot of discussion about whether we should keep adding stories, but we can talk about that later, perhaps. Um, but basically, it, it, the idea of doing this, of setting it up robustly, is because it has now given us 7,000 families who represent the diversity of all the families who are having children in New Zealand. Really importantly, out of the 7,000, we have 24% of our children identify as Māori, or their parents expect them to identify as Māori, 20% who are expected to identify as Pacific, 16% who are expected to identify as Asian, and some 75% who are still expected to identify as European or other. Now, those of you who did maths like I did will know that that doesn't add to 100%, but we did allow them to identify with more than one group, and many people do. We expect that one in two of our children, according to the parents, will identify with two ethnic groups. Many will identify with three or more. So you can't just assign a child to a group and leave them there. This is about understanding not only the intentions, but how that identity and that culture and every other part of identity, what it means to be a New Zealander in the 21st century, whether you like rugby, whether you think you want to be an all black or whether you just want to do well educationally, or maybe you want to do both. But all of those things as they evolve over time will be things that we're looking at exploring for these children. So, in terms of where we're going, how am I doing, Roger? Another couple of minutes? Or are you going to stop me in a second? Long as you like, Susan. Pardon me? Long, long as the like. night, longer than I like, goodness <laughs> me. <laughs> as long as it's not more so, than two minutes. <laughs> two minutes, okay. Let me give you a bit of a sense of who these families are, since I've told you a little bit about the study itself. So far, we have collated and got together the information from the mums and the dads. We asked them separately about what life was going to be like for these children before they were born. And we created a report, which you're very welcome to help yourself to, which has all of the details in it growing up in New Zealand, which is also available on our website if you'd like to see it. It's about the environments that will shape these children's life course, really, from even before their birth. And the 7,000 families who do represent the diversity of the families in New Zealand today are incredibly diverse themselves. One in three of the children, their parents are born overseas. So some of them didn't grow up here. Many of them didn't grow up here. Many only moved when they were adults. We have children who are being born into homes where one in five of the homes doesn't use English on an everyday basis. 98% of them say they can use English, but 20% of them don't. And there are 80 different languages being used out there. That's a huge challenge for thinking about formal transitions and, or transitions into formal education, for example. We have 75% of our families now over the first 12 months who have shifted at least once. And 50% have moved twice or more in the last five years. That is huge. We have a hugely mobile population. Over half don't own their own home and possibly never will. Many don't have any support around them in terms of family. Many have come here specifically to have their children. We asked them a whole lot of things about their intentions for what their children were going to do after birth. Breastfeeding, immunisation, returning to work and so on. Most of the mums expect to be back to work within a year of their child's birth. Many would like to be home for two years, some would like to be home for 21. The dads want to be home for about six months, most of them only expect to be home for about three. If you think about where they get their information, it, it's really important because obviously that sort of getting beneath the ideas of just describing is what we're interested in doing. And they get them from diverse sources. Clearly they trust family and friends. They get um, interesting information about immunisation from their health professionals. They're not the same ones clearly, but if you look at the bars of those who are either for or against, you see pretty much equal numbers that the, the mums are getting. Similarly about diet and pregnancy, similarly about alcohol and things, and smoking for that matter, which you think should be pretty straightforward. 
things like knowing about their rights in terms of working for tax credits or other sort of supplements that are out there to enable them to help them to bring up their children is very sketchy, and particularly sketchy for those families in the most disadvantaged environments. So huge diversity out there in the 7,000. That's actually great, because we want to look right across the population to find out what's happening, what works, as well as what doesn't. So not just focusing in on the negative and not just the blame and the shame, but the whole idea of what works and what the differences are across the population, right across the population and within our specific groups. Because really it's the only study of its kind that can tell us about Māori and Pacific children in particular who are growing up in New Zealand today. There is no other way to gather that evidence. That's maybe a bit provocative, you can take me up on that later. I think the other thing that we try and do is to look at the multiple layers of environment. We don't treat the child as if it only exists in the environment of its family. We recognise that a family is shaped by its neighbourhood, by its community, by the societies around it, by the policies that exist, and everything is in dynamic interac interaction. So we take the philosophy, if you like, that it takes a village to raise a child, which someone much more wise than me said, rather than just blaming the parents for what might be happening to that child. And we try and look at policy as an overarching sort of process that involves all of those levels of influence. So that's a bit of a brief introduction to the Growing Up in New Zealand study. I know it is brief. It's kind of hard to talk about the depth of things that we do in 15 minutes, but I hope it might have set off some ideas. Very happy to answer some questions once you've um, got something to eat. Okay, or whatever. fantastic. Thanks, Susan.